Good afternoon and welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Today is Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. We're going to have a great guest coming up, Robert Bork Jr. to talk a little bit about antitrust policy. And I, th- I think you're really going to enjoy that. And uh, we're going to be talking with him about all sorts of different aspects of that. But first, we're going to go over today's news. Obviously, the Mar-a-Lago raid is still very much on everybody's mind. It's very much in the commentary. We actually have a couple of posts on that this morning. Probably more to come as uh, developments uh, come about. But one big question right now, our good friend Hugh Hewitt uh, wrote for the Washington Post that really Donald Trump should release the search warrant that was served at Mar-a-Lago so that we can see what the basis of this was. And it's since come out that his attorneys weren't provided a copy of it. They were apparently shown a copy of the warrant, but the warrant itself is sealed, which raises all sorts of questions about what's going on here. Um, And uh, the Department of Justice hasn't really explained that. Eric Trump told the Daily Mail that they refused to uh, provide a copy, which would normally be how in the normal process would be to hand the person a copy of the search warrant for their own records and and then to proceed with the search uh so why they didn't get a copy of that why it's sealed and it's not just apparently the application that's sealed it's the warrant itself uh secret warrants are not usual uh in american jurisprudence certainly not when you're serving them on a former president So I would imagine that Republicans are going to have a lot to say about that if that turns out to be the case. If he does have the search warrant, I don't think it hurts for him to release it. I have an analysis of that based on what Hugh is writing. But I also not not sure it's going to be terribly germane to what the Department of Justice is actually up to. So we are going to have lots and lots of commentary about that over the next few days until we get more information on this. Breaking news this morning, the Department of Justice has, uh, has indicted a member of the IRGC for uh, plotting to kill John Bolton, former national security advisor to Donald Trump. And of course, John Bolton's been around forever. He was uh, at one point the uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations during the Bush administration uh, and very well known in terms of being a uh, conservative sort of trending into neocon um, on foreign policy. Uh, Very smart guy. I've interviewed him before. He's a very, very gracious man and a very nice guy. Uh, certainly doesn't deserve to have a $300,000 contract put on his head, but that's what the IRGC was doing. And apparently shortly thereafter, the Biden administration was trying to see if it could remove the uh, remove the IRGC from the State Department terror list. That's going to raise a lot of questions, and it should, because if the, the FBI was tracking this back in November of last year, and it was in early March of this year, that it, that it first got reported that the Biden administration was going to uh, was was at least negotiating on the point of removing them from the terror list. That's a big, huge deal. And members of this administration should be called in front of Congress to explain why they were doing that while the IRGC was conducting an assassination plot against a former U.S. official. Um, and apparently a fairly significant one. Three hundred thousand dollars even for the IRGC is no small sum of cash. So they were clearly looking to uh, make a point. Probably um, it, the indictment talks about this. Uh, if you read the indictment, uh, it probably has to do with the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Although, um, in fact, the indictment pretty much makes that allegation. Although there was some, there was some. It's it's a little vague sometimes on terms of that. But uh, you know, Soleimani's uh, Soleimani's uh, targeting uh, came into that. Soleimani, of course, being on the battlefield in Iraq, taking aim at American uh, soldiers and American installations in Iraq, uh, and made himself part of the battlefield. Uh, John Bolton is not that. That this is an assassination attempt, and um, flat out, it's a terrorist act. And any administration that has this information is still negotiating whether or not to take the um, take that organization off the terror list really should answer a whole lot of questions, and very publicly so. Uh, we also have um, uh, information on inflation. Uh, very interesting inflation report, CPI inflation today, PPI, you know, producer price index, probably coming out tomorrow, I believe. So we'll have more on that with Dwayne on Thursday's podcast. But um, uh, inflation... Drop down year on year inflation and CPI dropped down to 8.5% from its from a peak of 9.1%. Uh, 
Mostly, though, because the demand for gasoline dropped pretty dramatically in the second quarter. Uh, this does not appear to be an issue of massive supplies coming into the in, into the picture, uh, massive new supplies, um, and it doesn't appear to be uh, a, a demand that's being satisfied. This is a drop in demand, which usually signals a, a an economic recession when you have that kind of pullback, especially in the summertime, where you expect gas prices to really go up. Um, so. I go over that later on in the day. I'll have a uh, post about uh, Joe Biden's spin on this, claiming that there was 0% inflation last month, which is nonsense. That's absolutely not true. It's not true in any sense. Even if you're looking at month on month being flat, which it was, uh, <laughs> it just means that prices didn't go up or down based, uh, you know, for, based on a comparison from last month, where prices went up 1.3% month on month over May. So this isn't some sort of 0% or some sort of return to normalcy, which is how he wants to paint this. Uh, and there's a whole lot of spin coming out of the White House. Ron Klain has spin coming out of the White House on this inflation report. Most of it's egregious. We're going to go over all of it. So uh, stay tuned for that on hot air. And we'll probably talk about it with Dwayne tomorrow uh, when we get a chance to see the PPI report. Um, until then, enjoy this conversation uh, with Robert Bork Jr., son of uh, the famed jurist, son of the man who wrote um, The Antitrust Paradox, which he republished on his own. He formed a publishing company to republish that book on his own, wrote a new forward for it. And we talk about uh, where conservatives may be missing the boat on antitrust and why we probably shouldn't be going along with Amy Klobuchar on economic policy. It's a great discussion. He's actually a lot of fun. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show, and you're already seeing my guest here, uh, Robert Bork Jr., who has uh, written a, a new forward uh, about a year or two ago to his father's book, uh, the um, uh, excuse me, the <laughs> the antitrust paradox. Bob, I couldn't even spit this thing out right right at the right at the right out right out of the I'm gate. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, Bob, thanks for being here, and and I got to tell you, I mean, I think that. Um, I've had a lot of issues with the outcomes of conservative reluctance to enforce antitrust laws. And I think you were writing a good response to some of my concerns about this because you've been writing about this in Real Clear Policy at the Wall Street Journal. You wrote a good piece last year about this. And of course, you're at the antitrusteducationproject.org uh, following up on all of this type of work. Uh, Let's start off by talking about where we're at in terms of the antitrust proposals that you're seeing right now and that you see is very problematic. Okay. Well, uh, so we're at a point, it's, I think some people like to call them inflection points. Yep. But um, where the Democrats, the, the radical progressives uh, in Congress uh, are close to getting antitrust legislation through that would in fact rewrite 43 years of antitrust uh, uh, enforcement policy. Uh, when my father wrote the antitrust paradox in 1978, he was looking at what, what went wrong for the previous 70 years with antitrust enforcement and said that the way to fix it was to focus not on inefficient competitors and trying to pick one or, or, or over the other, but focus on the consumer and even now, the FTC website admits that the consumer is the focus of, uh, they just have a different way of getting there, right. the focus of antitrust enforcement. Um, and then the Supreme Court in 1979 adopted his rationale in a, in a case called Ryder v. Sonotone, and it's been adopted ever since many times and used as the way uh, regulators and, uh, and the courts think about antitrust enforcement. So we're at a point now where that's all about to get chucked out the window because that's a judicial opinion, judicial opinions. And Congress is looking at statutory changes and change the statute, you change the law and then the courts have to enforce the law or at least they're supposed to enforce the law. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, so we're right, right on the cusp of something bad happening. Uh, but the good news may be that uh, the, these proposals put forward by particularly Amy Schumer in the Senate and by David Sickling in the House uh, are so bad that uh, people, uh, their, their colleagues are sort of 
inching away. And uh, even Chuck Schumer, until last week, said he wasn't going to bring the Amy Klobuchar's bill to a vote because she didn't have the votes and he had he had concerns about it and all that sort of thing. So maybe they'll. But but now he said he will allow it to be voted on when they come back from the August break. That yeah, remains, that remains to be seen. But that's what he says. So, in principle, right? I mean, I I come to this after having been arguing for the last at least couple of years and maybe a little bit longer than that, that conservatives really should take antitrust uh, enforcement more seriously because what I've seen is the effect of consolidation across a lot of different industries where you have more and more power accruing into fewer and fewer hands. You know, that's certainly been the impression that we're getting. And that has political consequences that really aren't good for conservatives in the long run, right? As as we've been kind of discovering. Now, I would say that that's really the motivation that I'm talking about. There's been a lot of talk about doing about applying this to big tech, which is Klobuchar's bill, mm -hmm. as, a, as a means of regulating the speech and content that goes on it, which is, I think, entirely bad. And, and I think that focusing on one industry really misses the point. But I, I'm going to I'm throw that out there because and I, I'm going to let you respond to this with with the proviso up front that after reading some of the, the material that you that you've published over the last year or so, I'm kind of thinking that maybe um, that maybe I should temper that just a little bit. And I mean, I'm still concerned about consolidation, but I think you raised some very good points about perhaps where American industry actually is at the moment, Bob. I feel sort of like LBJ having, you know, he, when he, when he said, I lost when I, when I, when you lose uh, Walter Cronkite, you've lost America. So if I've gained Ed Morrissey, maybe I'm gaining America. I don't know. Um, look, the uh, antitrust enforcement uh, regime that we've been under for the last 43 years has worked. Uh, it has helped, not exclusively, but it has helped, you know, triple the size of the economy. It has helped create more wealth, more innovation, more jobs. And this crowd wants to chuck that all out in favor of sort of new woke policies. Basically, the government monopoly doesn't like that it has competition from big tech and other uh, capitalist enterprises. And it wants to, uh, you know, put the kibosh on that. So I'm not saying that there's not there are not reasons to bring antitrust cases, principally things like price fixing, uh, you know, or you know, territorial questions of you know trying to block out some a competitor. But but let's just see. The, the problem is you have to define what is the monopoly, where where is the concentration. You can look at Amazon and say, my God, that thing is huge, but is it in and of itself a monopoly? Is perhaps one of its markets is it a, in a monopoly uh and if it is you know you should look at that the but the but the rationale of the left here is that we hate everything that's big and successful because it's a challenge to us i think and i think it's really sort of a comes from a marxist perspective right i'm not i'm not the first person to say that actually christine wilson who's a current republican commissioner on the fdc has gave a great speech where she just said look these these folks here are marxists they believe in critical legal studies. They're they're enforcing, trying to uh, change the law, change uh, the regulations in that mode, in that model. And that's, I think, very dangerous. I think it's going to lead, if it, they succeed, and if they get the help of Congress that they want, to the fossilization of capitalism. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. You talk about being case by case. I mean, there's a case that's, it's actually not big tech at all, although it is communications. Uh, that just popped up on my radar screen. I mean, it was about a week ago or so, which is Penguin Random House uh, trying to acquire Simon and Schuster. Right now, mm -hmm. full disclosure: the one book that I've managed to publish, <laughs> I published through the for the through the very good offices of Penguin Random House and their Crown Forum uh, <laughs> imprint. So I do not want to cast aspersions in either direction here, but it is an interesting case because Penguin Random House has actually acquired a number of smaller publish um, publishers, and Simon and Schuster is probably one of the most significant um, uh, competitors that they have out there. And that might be more of a legitimate 
issue than say Amazon or Google, um, or maybe well, not. I don't know enough about that particular case. All I did, I did read a funny story, funny peculiar story, that the uh, lawyer for uh, the publishers, uh, when they had Stephen King come up to be their sort of celebrity witness, didn't didn't even bother to cross examine him. <laughs> so, <laughs> fine, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that. I mean, as much as I've enjoyed Stephen King's writings over the years. I'm not necessarily sure that he has a, a great deal of um, well, he, to say he about said what we all. He said what we all think is a matter of common sense. There are more publishers. There's more publishing. There's more competition sure. for right, you know, writers to get better advances. I got to tell you, when I republished the uh, antitrust paradox, it had been out of print for years. And uh, I looked around I talked to some publishers. And they all wanted to make me a re really awful, just horrible offers and uh, where I would give up control of the book. And I said, no. And I saw, I, you know, guess what? I started a publishing company, Fork Publishing, and I published the book. And I got Amazon and Barnes and Noble to, you know, uh, uh, sell it. It's printed by a private uh, printing company. Uh, you know, yes, if you want to be, if you want to write, if you want to be Stephen King, I guess you need Simon & Schuster. But well, if you want to get your ideas out, there are other ways to do it. And you don't know, you don't necessarily need those, but I'm, Again, I don't know enough about those two. Companies. Right? No, no, and I agree. I'm. I, I mean, ju I just find it an in interesting case. I, I, I couldn't give you the the full details of that. I, I'd say that it's more like if you want to get Stephen King like checks from a publisher, you're going to need to have a publisher like Penguin Random House or Simon and Schuster or Harper Collins or some of the other uh, big um, publishers to write those kinds of checks up front. But then, of course, it also helps be Stephen King. Only one, <laughs> like only one percent of the authors get those kind of checks. Right. So the rest of them and us uh, get nothing. And uh, Right. So, I mean, that doesn't necessarily make it a great case for antitrust. And I think that what you're writing here is that we really need to have a, we need to do the math. I mean, this is the antitrust paradox you, you write about, or, you know, you've written about this in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was last year, and possibly in your Newsmax interview more recently about how your father sat down and learned calculus just so that he could understand price theory to write this book. And um, and do the hard work of actually delving into what all of these mechanics mean, and I think that part of, I think part of uh, your legitimate pushback against Klobuchar and against some of these, and not, not not just necessarily Democrats either, they're populist Republicans. Well, let's who, talk about them in a second. Yeah, um, is that they don't do that homework. They don't consider the consequences. What they're doing is they're reacting to a populist pushback against. Um, against, you know, more centralized power, um, you know, power sources, power uh, power centers in the economy as well as in politics, which, again, I don't think is necessarily legitimate, but you have to do it in a smart way. Yeah. So, uh, yes, well, they, they don't like competition, right? Right. So, um, that's funny. They're fighting for competition, except when it comes to them. They don't want it. Uh, but... Uh, I, I forgot where you were going with your question. But. Oh, I'm 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 sorry. I, I mean the the um, is in doing the math is in doing the hard work. Yes, yes. I'm sure Joe Biden has never done any calculus in his life, but uh, <laughs> nor I, I doubt actually that Amy Klobuchar has either. But uh, yeah, so you do the math, and you you realize that the law for 70 years, uh, really more, longer than that, was used to protect. Uh, inefficient competitors against each other and uh, leading to more inefficiency and higher prices and less innovation. And so the argument was that my father put forward and, and others put forward was that, uh, you know, if you, if you pick a, a neutral standard, consumer welfare standards, that's politically neutral, uh, it, you know, and, and say, is, are consumers benefiting or being harmed by this? You have a much better chance of getting it right than just trying to look at one widget maker versus another widget maker and see if they one of them has a more righteous cause uh, and you end up protecting both of them from having to compete with each other really so but, I, I gotta tell you you mentioned the i i don't i, I don't want to rush ahead here but no, you, go mentioned, ahead. you mentioned the conservatives yeah you know uh ted cruz and and my good friend chuck grassley and others uh, t uh, john kennedy and uh lindsey graham and Josh Hawley, who's lost his mind, and um, and others, 
uh, Republicans, are, you know, they voted this thing, Klobuchar's bill, out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and some Democrats actually did not. But um, but the, uh, the their their beef, of course, is conservative speech. Right. And and there's absolutely nothing in Klobuchar's bill that will do nothing, not a word that will do anything for uh, ending censorship of conservative speech. Uh, in fact, there's really nothing about innovation or uh, online choice either. But, you know, that's the way that's the way we write bills. That's why we have an inflation reduction bill uh, that just passed. That's really nothing to do with reducing inflation. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. So so that they, 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 at least we know they know how to name bills properly uh, to get them passed. Uh, but so those guys are nuts uh, because they're so angry at at big tech for this conservative censorship that they just can't see past their own noses and realize that this is not the way to do it. Antitrust is not written uh, to help with that. And even if it was, it's not in the bill. So, you know, what we need to do is pass legislation to amend Section 230, which is that regulation that involves publishers and their rights and protections, uh, and or, you know, come up with other approaches to that. I'm told there's nothing in the bill that will do anything about that. Uh, but these folks are they're sort of like reverse Trump derangement syndrome, you know? Uh, the, the left is deranged about Trump and the right is deranged about big tech. So they can't, and they both, neither of them can see past their own noses. To, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, and this is a big, huge issue. I mean, this is really across the spectrum too about big tech, you know, speech control. I mean, this has been a huge issue you know, just in terms of something that that came up over the weekend, right? Brian Stalter was talking to Joe Biden's um, spokesperson. I think his name is Michael LaRosa mm -hmm. and saying, oh, well, you know, talking about whether or not Joe Biden's going to run again in 2024 and say, well, you know, this Hunter Biden story is no longer a right wing media, um, right wing media story. It's a, it's an actual story. And my, my response to that, which will be up at hot air after after we get done talking here is yeah, we know. It was always a real story. It was you guys that yes, kept trying to no. say it was disinformation and trying to and trying to silence it and shut it down. That's probably the most egregious example I can think of of that type of bias. And so but it happens. It happens a lot. It's yeah. not just that stuff. And a funny thing is that it happened when I wrote that uh, Wall Street Journal op ed that you were talking about. Uh, I, some friends of mine tried to put it up on Facebook and it came right down. It got blocked. And about 20 minutes later, it came back up. But it was. Uh, Maybe they realized it was probably in their best interest. I don't know. Um, right. But, <laughs> I mean, actually, it, there's a lot of irony in that book. <laughs> they knocked, yeah. they knocked so, that So, you know, but it had the name Bork and it had his picture. And you know, they probably they probably all went, you know, <laughs> and blocked it. Um, anyway, uh, look, there's uh, there are things that need to be done in antitrust, uh, but you have to do it right. You have to you know do the math. You have to focus on the, on specific markets. But then you you know or you can waste huge amounts of time and money, like uh, Trump administration did uh, suing uh, AT and T when it bought Time Warner. Uh, the judge ultimately let it go through, and about two years later, Time Warner uh, AT and T said, you know, we don't know what we're doing here. We don't know how to we don't know how to manage a content company, so they sold it to Discovery. Um, you know, so hey, the market the marketplace worked. And markets tend to work. Uh, that's why Yahoo is not the uh, search engine anymore that it was. Right. That's why uh, MySpace isn't, you know, isn't around. Or if it's around, it's, I don't even know if it's around. I, don't even, uh, I have no know, idea. But Facebook, but, and that's why Facebook is is slowly sinking. Um, yep. You know, they're losing to TikTok and other things. I have no doubt that, you know, they will figure out a way to uh, recover or shift into different markets or offer different innovative services, perhaps they will. And then if they do that, they will survive. But it doesn't require the government to come in and say, you know, we don't like the cut of your jib and we're going to bust you up. You know, Bob, I think the the Trump action against AT&T is really a good case in point of why you want to limit this power in government, because it was pretty clear that this was not really, I mean, you're going to, I know that some people are going to object to this, but it was pretty clear right from the get-go. This really didn't have anything to do with some sort of principled stand. Donald Trump didn't like CNN. 
Yeah. And he was trying to throw he was trying to throw a wrench in the works. And thanks to the FTC and the Department of Justice and 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 the the regulations that we have, he was able to do that. And I'm not saying that every government is going to is going to manipulate this for their own personal ends, but that's what you that's that's the possibility that you get. And I don't know that I, I mean it wasn't as though this was part of a overarching you know, philosophical slash ideological approach to antitrust. This was really kind of revenge, and it came it came out in the trial too. That yeah, you know, <laughs> there's there's some there's some very you know suspicious motives going on in this particular action. But that's the reason why you really want to be careful about giving government that kind of power. Look, there are uh, uh, Stephen Moore. He's probably been on your show at some time or another. I don't know. I think maybe, or maybe when I was guest hosting for Hugh, yeah. Yeah. You know, his view is a little bit farther, I don't know if it's right than mine. His view is the last uh, righteous uh, antitrust case was when they busted up Ma Bell. Yep. That did need to get busted up. It was a government-sanctioned uh, monopoly. Yep. And government-sanctioned monopolies are bad. Um, so... I mean, look, NASA, NASA, I don't really, this, I may be speaking, you know, uh, out of, incorrectly here, but NASA basically had control with the defense companies for years over launch vehicles. Yep. And, and then they didn't. And now we have other launch companies out there, you know, making better products than I think they had before. So uh, no, I, I think like that's the, a good that's a good analogy. I mean, I think it it's a little different. NASA, Na, I mean, AT and T was just simply they flat out owned the whole thing. And yeah. you're right. It and I remember. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that people were really unhappy because they're saying we've got the best phone system in the world. What are we doing? And then, of course, you know, ten years down the road, you've got this explosion of innovation that AT and T <laughs> had been right. Exactly. You know, you got. I mean, you've got like a hundred, um, a hundred Apollo eleven capsules right here. Yes, maybe, maybe more than that, maybe a thousand of them right, in, right in the palm of your hand these days, which never would have happened because AT and T was keeping very, um, uh, you know, was keeping a lid on innovation because it was costly, and um, but at the time everybody was really angry about it. Um, that's your. I think you're right. That's probably the last really good action that we've seen on antitrust but we're we've seen the, the the next one on AT&T was one of the worst ones that we just got done discussing uh, and i think again it's it gets back to the it gets back to your father's assessment that this is incredibly complicated and that what you really need to have squarely in your sights as in the AT&T example the first AT&T example the 1981 AT&T example mm -hmm. is consumers and their ability to to pick and choose for themselves and to allow innovation to provide more of those choices and if you're not if you're not working in that realm you're really working in politics which is something that you, you know this is but, a really bad tool in politics like i said the consumer welfare standard is uh is uh small d democrat democratic yes you know? people get to vote with their dollars, with their feet, where they, you know, what they want to buy, pick pick their own stuff. They don't have to have the government tell them that's a particular product or technology that they have to buy. Um, if you think about it, our our government now is trying to emulate European regulation, you know, and and European yeah. antitrust policy. And I dare you to tell me anything that we have developed in the last fifty years here that they have also developed. There is no you know, palm, like, you know, the French word for apple. There's right. no, there's, no uh, there's, 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 they, they don't do that. All they do is uh, regulate stuff and uh, siphon money off, you know, our companies and their own, um, but it seems mostly ours. Yeah. It's, it's a more regulated environment. You get less innovation because of, not that, the, that, that there's no innovation, obviously there, there's obviously some innovation going on there, but you get less of it because you've got government too involved in this. And one of the other things that we should probably mention too, just part of your um, your essay last week that's specific to the Klobuchar bill, was is the national security and privacy nightmare that uh, that you outline I think very uh, clearly in a very brief 
you know, part of this, which is that we're dealing with we're dealing with companies that have an awful lot of information from consumers that was given, you know, at least um, nominally in a voluntary relationship with these um, with these uh, big tech corporations. Now, some people might regret that down the road, <laughs> maybe for good reason. Hey, we can talk about that, too. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe they should. I think we need to watch that. I'm very concerned about privacy. Um, but but uh, you're right. There are two provisions in this bill and not to get too much into the weeds with them. But one of them uh, basically opens up uh, the inner workings of these platforms to competitors. Competitors can go in there and dig around and understand the algorithms and get in and see how they work in the software and everything. Seems dangerous to me. Also, seems like there may be some property rights implicated in all of that. Sure. And then two. Uh, they can uh, get data. Competitors can get data, you know, uh, data for, of uh, of uh, users. So I don't know. I understand what the argument for that is, anyway. But one thing is, there are a lot of these Far Eastern or Chinese companies that will be poking around getting your data, and uh, you know, or or even through a third party company going in and getting your data. Because the third party company doesn't, you know, another seller doesn't have really good protections. So they'll go in there and then they'll go through and get your data. Now, why uh, the communist government wants to know that I, I bought a, 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 a lead for my dog that I can put, you know, so I can put it in a thing screwed in the backyard and, and she can run around like an idiot out there. I don't know. But, you know, that could be a part of their invasion plan. They want to know what the dog's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who's got dogs? Um, but anyway, the ser but to make to, not to be light about it, there, there's a lot you can do with data, and they and why our government would allow them to get it, I have no earthly idea. I, it just shows the the sort of low level of thought that has gone into this whole process. Exactly, and 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 again, I, what I would recommend is that you go and read these essays. That Bob has written. I do want to spend a couple of minutes at least, though, talking about the Antitrust Education uh, Project. That's antitrusteducationproject.org. That's pretty easy to remember. Antitrusteducationproject.org. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, and um, well, the, the, sh the short version is uh, back in 2016, before the uh, election in 2016, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Warren, got all of her friends together. It was sort of like an Appalachian meeting of the left, I guess. You know? <laughs> and uh, and they, um, for those people who don't remember what the Appalachian Oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was the famous meeting of the mob bosses. I think it was like, 1956, right. was, 1958, the, something the like that. The five yeah. families. All uh, so she got all her friends together and they, you know, they start talking about, we're going to, we're coming after all these big companies. We, you know, we don't like this. And, and, and her bill, my God, her bill is just awful. It just, you know, no, no mergers over a billion dollars, you know, that, so which is like chump change. Um, anyway, and, and so I saw that, uh, read about that, and I sort of wondered where my father's book was and found out that it was out of print. And so I launched a company to ultimately to get it back into print. And we did on April of 2021 uh, with a new forward by uh, uh, Senator Mike Lee from Utah and a, uh, actually an introduction by him and a forward by me and uh, decided to get into the fight to protect really this is a labor of sort of familial love i mean i wanted to get in and defend his ideas absolutely uh because he wasn't here to do it and there are other people who are too but uh so we um we launched the book we, we launched the antitrust education project we've been every day writing and speaking and talking to people like you and your audience uh, and uh, uh, occasionally uh, tweeting, um, actually a lot of tweeting. <laughs> and, um, you know, because I'm very worried. I'm not, I'm not kidding when I say what they're up to is going to lead to the fossilization of capitalism. We're already sort of on that road anyway. Um, but let's not allow them to inhibit uh, innovation and growth and technology and, and uh, job creation uh, by just putting the squeeze on all these big companies. Well, you can go to antitrusteducationproject.org to find out about that. You can go to Amazon or uh, you can go to Barnes and Noble. You can go to wherever fine books are sold to find the antitrust paradox 
It's written originally by Robert H. Bork and uh, republished by Bob Bork Jr., who we've been speaking to. And Bob, it's a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I hope that you'll come back from time to time to uh, continue this, especially as more and more of these um, antitrust issues pop up. Thank you. I'd love to. And, uh, you know, let's keep an eye on what they're going to do when they get back from uh, their, their summer vacation, because I think they'll all be full of hot dogs and uh, beans and ready to go. Yeah, well, what, was it vigilance is the price of liberty? Yes. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that um, you know, um, Pepto-Bismol is sort of the price of vigilance these days. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, Bob Bork, thank well you. Said. <laughs> well, maybe not, but thanks. I, I appreciate that anyway. Bob Bork, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. All right, folks, stay tuned for a little bit more from the Ed Morrissey Show coming up right after this. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com for Town Hall. On Monday, the FBI and Department of Justice took an unprecedented action in conducting a search on a former president's residence. Donald Trump has been in an ongoing dispute with the National Archives over his compliance with the Presidential Records Act. That dispute led to allegations of mishandling classified material, which reportedly prompted the warrant and the raid. This raises new concerns over politicization at the Department of Justice. Under Attorney General Merrick Garland's leadership, the handling of school board protests and non-enforcement of federal law regarding the intimidation campaigns targeting Supreme Court justices had already raised those questions. No one is above the law, and a federal magistrate approved the search warrant. But Merrick Garland must publicly explain the decision to raid Mar-a-Lago rather than just subpoena the documents sought. That explanation had better justify the historical norm destroyed in this raid, or it will stand as yet more evidence of politicization in Joe Biden's Department of Justice. It doesn't look good. I'm Ed Morrissey. Thank you for watching and listening to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Be sure to subscribe at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube to get alerted as soon as new episodes get published. You can support the Ed Morrissey Show and Hot Air's VIP reporting by becoming a VIP member, too. Visit hotairvip.com and use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, all one word, for 40% off your membership. Choose VIP Gold and gain membership to access to all of the town hall sites. Thanks again for watching and listening.